Sheriff's Office. Hi, good morning. To truly understand the story of Jamie Osuna and the events that led up to the beheading of his cellmate, you have to understand how he was caught for the first murder he was charged with. He told me that he's been to my house and he has really small feet for a man and there's footprints all by my window. And what is his name? Jamie, J-A-M-I-E, uh -huh. Osuna, O-S-U-N-A. You see, there was a woman who was victimized by Osuna long before he murdered Yvette Pena in 2011, and long after. Was there anybody hurt or stabbed at the Morocco Hotel on Union last night? Um, because he said he did it. He said I he don't know what. Killed a woman in the Morocco Hotel on Union. The woman whose voice you hear would ultimately be his downfall. But before all of this, she played another significant role in his life. She was his wife and the mother of his child. I just spoke with the Bakersfield Police Department and they did not familiar with anything that occurred last night. So they're still checking, oh, but, but as far as I know, um, you know, we have not been able to locate anything. So, okay. okay. I just wanted to make sure I hope there wasn't a woman, you know, suffering because he's really psycho. Five days after Osuna's wife told a 911 dispatcher she wanted to make sure Osuna hadn't really stabbed someone at the Morocco Motel and that there wasn't a woman suffering because he's, quote, really psycho, a maintenance man at the motel found Yvette Pena's body. She'd been tortured and murdered. But how his wife fits into this story isn't that simple. She and Jamie's relationship was anything but simple. I don't know if it was real or not at this point, but he could mimic being a really good person. I'm Olivia LaVoice. This is The Man with a Thousand Faces. We're keeping Jane's identity anonymous for a couple reasons. But the main one is not just to protect her identity, but to protect the son, who's still a child, that she had with Jamie. The first time I spoke to Jane was eight years after Yvette's murder, but just a couple days after Jamie was found in his cell, along with his mutilated cellmate. I was still in Florida at that family reunion. It was an early, particularly gray morning on the bayou. I sat in a gazebo on the gator-filled swamp. The fog was so thick, you could barely make out the trees that grew out of the water with their long, twisted branches that looked like witch fingers, covered in Spanish moss. Through the screened-in gazebo, down an old wooden dock, I could see my family from afar, having their morning coffee. Completely oblivious, I was on the phone with a woman who had one of the craziest stories I'd ever heard. Hardy was the first meeting. Did he have the tattoos on his face at that point? No, he didn't. Jane and Jamie's love story began in December 2008. Jane was 37. Jamie was 20. Jane was a retired prison psych nurse with no criminal record. Jamie was an unemployed parolee with a ninth grade education and still not old enough to legally drink. Their paths crossed at Jane's spacious home in a middle-class neighborhood. This particular evening, Jane was being what some might consider a cool mom. My son had a house party, and my nephew invited Jane. Jane, a single mother, was thin but voluptuous. With big green eyes, she accentuates with thick mascara and full lips. She often wore jeans and tank tops with her long hair down. That night, at her 16-year-old son's party, filled with teens and young adults, she decided to let loose a bit. She was more like another party guest than the mom in charge. There's alcohol there. I was dancing with a young man, and my nephew didn't like it. So my nephew ran to get Jamie, who threatened the kid and grabbed the knife, and ran after the kid across the street. Wait, wait, wait. So the first time you ever met Jamie, He's yeah. at the house party, and Jamie pulls a knife on a guy that you're no, dancing grabbed, with? No, he grabbed a knife on him. I bet you what. So mm -hmm. were you like, oh, my God, what's going on? And who is this crazy guy? That I was pretty shocked. According to police reports, Jamie stabbed the other young man. But the wound wasn't deep. The victim was okay, more shaken up than anything. 
especially considering he didn't know Jamie or why Jamie had attacked him. Jamie was arrested for assault with a deadly weapon and for violating parole. Jane, meanwhile, was issued a citation for being the adult host at a party that supplied alcohol to minors. So when he was locked up, um, did you guys, like, communicate when he was in jail? Yeah, that's what I said. He kept writing me. He said all the right words. He was very articulate. So after Jamie was arrested for stabbing someone at Jane's teenage son's house party, Jamie started courting Jane from behind bars. Keep in mind, the only face-to-face -face interaction they'd had was the chaos he caused at her home. He was also 17 years younger than her. Jane had a child about the same age as Jamie. Gentleman, very intellectual, talked about philosophy a lot, psychology, very charming, very respectful. I asked Jane how Jamie was able to convince her his actions during their only in-person interaction together weren't completely insane. He made it seem like it wasn't an overreaction. He made it seem like he was defending your honor. Correct. I wasn't really thinking clearly. Like, he said all the perfect words. So I really don't know what was going through his head. I just know what he portrayed. For about a year, Jamie was locked up and wooing Jane. She said the attention was flattering and she indulged it, but she never really saw it going anywhere. All I did was agree to pick him up when he got out at the bus station. And when that day came... I go pick him up. Then he has the one horn above and below an eye, each one eye, one eye, not like he is now. And then the, the line that looks like a joker smile. And I'm like, oh my God. It was the beginning of an evil clown face, like the Joker, Batman's most notorious nemesis. Only it wasn't drawn on Jamie's face, it was tattooed. He wasn't what she remembered, but still, she figured she could have a fun little rendezvous with him. So when Jamie suggested the two get a hotel room for the night, she figured, why not? I knew what was gonna happen. I mean, I knew why he wanted to go to a hotel, and it happened. And then I was just like, okay, he's kind of probably got it out of his system. I got it out of my system. Call it physical chemistry, intrigue, maybe curiosity. Whatever it was, Jane thought it ended in that hotel room. She certainly didn't anticipate this. I got pregnant at that motel, Olivia. Were you surprised oh. that you got pregnant? Yes, I was 39 years old. I was shocked. Do you know what I'm saying? I thought I was in perimenopause. So, I am a single mother of four kids. I have three baby daddies already. So I came from a very good family. But I'm trying to explain why I probably made horrible choices, especially with men. Something I noticed about Jane right away is her internal struggle to understand how she ended up with such a troubled love life. I guess being a nurse, this is what psychologists have told me, is I want to fix people. As a nurse, it's kind of part of your passion, hearing people, fixing people. But I just did it in the wrong way. I chose the wrong people. Jane says up until she began choosing the wrong people to try to fix, life was pretty good. Grew up in a great middle-class neighborhood, did all the things, I mean, traveled. Go to New York every summer, Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire. Great vacations, camping. Her issues with men started not long after she got pregnant as a teenager with an abusive boyfriend. Eventually, she got rid of him, raised her baby on her own, and put herself through nursing school. By the mid-90s, she was working at a prison in the psych ward division. She retired in 2005 following a brutal inmate attack, leaving her with a ruptured breast implant and a herniated disc in her neck. So it's very interesting to me, you have this horrific traumatic experience with an inmate, but then you find yourself married to an inmate. Do you think in a way, because you are around criminals all the time, that you ended up like getting attracted to? I don't think so. No, it wasn't like I was attracted to criminals or inmates or anything like that. Believe me, that happens. A lot of women lose their job over a handsome inmate. Ending up with Jamie is chalked up to this. 
in the boyfriend department. I wasn't maybe thinking as clearly as I should have. Flashing back to 2009, after a motel one-night stand resulted in the pregnancy, Jamie told the then almost 40-year-old Jane that he wanted to be the father he'd never had for his child. This would be his first baby, and Jane said he was over the moon. And he convinced her having him around would make life easier. So she agreed to give their odd, unexpected relationship a shot. I had a really rough pregnancy. I was bedridden most of it. I mean, I handled the bills, of course. But everything else, he was like Mr. Mom. Jamie told her he was old-fashioned and felt it was important they became husband and wife before their son was born. Very convincing, but he makes you think you want it. How was the wedding? It was all right. Jane still has the wedding pictures. Visibly pregnant, she wore a beige satin muumuu-style dress. Jamie had his hair slicked back into a long ponytail. He wore black and maroon, matching the flowers in Jane's bouquet, as well as the table napkins and the candles. He'd thought about those little details. It was a small affair with just their two families at Jamie's grandmother's home, filled with paper decorations, hand-strung banners, and plastic flowers. They had a big traditional wedding cake. Photos show Jane cutting into it while Jamie stands next to her with icing smeared on his face. He was like fatherzilla, bridezilla, or groomzilla, remember I told you? He was so into all of it. In every photo, Jane looks like she's in a daze. Did you ever love him? Um, I think I learned to during my pregnancy. No, I wouldn't say like a romantic type love, but more like I love that, he, that he's caring for me and my family, taking care of us. But if she thought her situation then was an ideal, it quickly got much worse. He's supposed to become very controlling. I know what he's doing. He's trying to control me, but I'm allowing it. Jane says he went from being sweet to cruel, attentive to possessive. Eventually, he became physically and mentally abusive. During one argument, he grabbed her mother's ashes off the mantle, ran off into the night. She'd never get them back. Who steals someone's mother's urn? I knew I took my mother's death hard. Jane called the police during that particular fight, and Jamie ended up back in prison for domestic violence, not long after their baby was born. When he got out, Jane gave him another shot. They tried to be a family, but by this time, she said Jamie had started using meth, which made him even more violent. One time he was choking me so bad, I bust a picture frame and I sliced his arm, and it hit his artery. He just wrapped it up with duct tape and a black sock, and went on his merry way. Now I know better. I should just run out the house and scream for help. Jane says she became almost numb to it all. She wasn't reacting the way she'd been initially. I believe this with my whole heart. He realized, okay, I can't get hurt anymore. So guess who he lashed out at? Who would a mother? How could he get, well, I won't make you guess. The new person he lashed out at was her seven-year-old son from a previous relationship. Jane says he lightly shoved the boy off the bed, staring into her eyes, waiting for the response from her he craved. He knew once he touched one of my children, that was a new way to get under my skin. He didn't realize that he was going to push me over the edge. I grabbed two knives from the kitchen. I didn't care who saw me. And my older kids were actually defending him. I told him to get out of my effing house. He was terrified because I flipped on him. And my older kids are like, Mom, what's wrong? Are you gone nuts? Mom, what are you doing? Because like, they didn't know any of this that was going on over yet. None of my older three children. You were literally were, holding him at knife point? Not up to him, but I had two knives. Like, come near me, buddy, and you're going to get it. A rare moment where the violent, terrifying Jamie was visibly shaken, knowing that if she wanted to, Jane could end it all. He didn't try to take the knives from her. He cowered away and called his grandmother, asking her to pick him up, like a frightened child wanting to leave a sleepover early. But he didn't stay away for long, and when he tried to return, Jane called the police. Jamie was arrested for a parole violation and sent back to prison. For a few months, Jane felt safe. Until Halloween. 
Jamie was released back into the world with his face now completely tattooed to look like the Joker, a day he likely blended in the most with society. But unlike everyone around him, his evil-looking mask wouldn't be coming off at the end of the night. He was back to haunt Jane, this time in a way that would change many lives forever. Sheriff's office. Hi, I called maybe like three or four hours ago regarding my um, a friend has been breaking a restraining order. Okay. I was just wondering if anyone was on their way or... Yes, ma'am. It looks like your call should be the next call up for service. Thank you. Threatening to, to kill me, and I'm terrified. 911, Seattle, severe emergency. He's threatening to kill me and all my children. Do you know where he's at right now? No, no, I'm terrified. I don't know what to do. 911, where's your emergency? I'm terrified. I have a little baby here. What's his name? Jamie Osuna. There's already a warrant for his arrest. For terror. He's in town. He's in town. Okay, but he's not there. Right. He's, all, he's, he's driving up and down my street. I've called three times. Okay, and he's on the phone again making threats to kill you? Yes, and he says, I will put words in your head. Those are his exact words. 911, how can I help you? Yes, hi ma'am. Um, is there any way we can get an officer out here? My aunt is like terrified. She's crying over here. This, okay, we I... got voice support and he just called and he's, I mean, I'm, I'm just a nephew. He's, this dude is no joke. So. We're going to be out there as soon as we can. However, we don't have a deputy available right now. Jamie was taunting her, stalking her. He'd be outside her window, but gone before any law enforcement ever showed up, making Jane look delusional, paranoid. It was a game that Jamie was winning. But then, Jamie called her and said this. First thing I was up, watch the news, bitch. I killed the woman at the Morocco. At this point, Jamie had been out of prison barely a week. It seemed too awful to be true, but Jane wasn't taking any chances. So she called the sheriff's department. I wanted to ask you, I don't know if this is true, but he's on drugs really bad. He said that, um, was there anybody hurt or stabbed at the Morocco Hotel on Union? That's thing? Dispatch checked with the police department, who had no such reports. I know darn well no cop went out there because she told me within three minutes. No one went. I know that from the fact that it only took her like two minutes to tell me there's nothing going on between the sheriff or the police department. Five days after Jane made that 911 call, she turned on the news. Police are being very tight-lipped as they continue their investigation into what may have happened inside one of these motel rooms. We do know that yesterday afternoon, an employee found 37-year-old Yvette Pena dead at the El Morocco Motel. Oh my God, my heart sunk. Like, this could be real. I call BPD. Detectives are at my door picking me up to me find the sitter. After five days of various schemes, including using an undercover female officer driving Jane's car meant to look like her, a tip finally led them to Jamie's great-grandparents' home. I got on Halloween, yeah. When cops sat down to interview Jamie after his arrest, they wanted to know about Yvette, the woman he was accused of torturing and murdering. Did you know her? <laughs> but Jamie only wanted to talk about one thing his wife. Being detectives, you know, is it, I, I don't know, is it, I mean, to look at a guy like me, you gotta ask yourself this question. Why is, why is she with uh, an individual like me for? I'm so young and she's so older. I'm so tattooed and yet she's not. Initially, investigators tried to keep him on track and remind him his marriage was irrelevant to his current situation. No, it's not. Jamie told them. Even though you say it has nothing to do with her, it has a part to do, to do with my actions. It has a part to do with things that I said. So she's stirring me up, building all this shit in my head. Eventually, the cops went along with it. How long have you been with her? Four, four, five years. That's me? To her nephew. And all your violations are because of all the shit with her? Well, not necessarily, but yeah, mostly since I met her. So why go back with her? That's what I'm saying. If she's all drama, I want to go back. That's what I'm saying. 
When it came to the evidence against him, Jamie spent most of his energy explaining why his wife would claim that he would confess to the murder. He says anything he said about killing a woman was just meant to scare her. I think he scared her. Or, you know, it was just a Somebody bunch of mind saying. games. If I was this crazy psycho murder, then how come I didn't kill her then when I have so much against her? Supposedly I'm going to do life and, and I'm going to do life over some woman I didn't know. But then detectives told him that witnesses noticed something about the murder victim. People think that this woman is probably my wife because the resemblance, the age, and so forth like that. A point that intrigued investigators. She kind of looks like your wife. Well, psychologically, you could p put it together. So Why? Rage and anger that you have towards your wife, you took out on her because of the resemblance. Jamie didn't admit to anything. After an hour and a half of questioning that was pretty much going nowhere, his interview ended on this note. You need to separate yourself with what you need. Yeah. Well, I damn agree. it, she just doesn't leave me alone. I don't know what the hell. I'll tell you what, man, get as far away from her as possible. What the hell am I supposed to do? I, I don't know how to do it, but, but. Yeah, yeah this, gonna, this, this will definitely put some distance <laughs> between you. Anything else, bud? Of all the different explanations Jamie gave as to why he wasn't Yvette Pena's killer, the one that stands out the most to me is if he were to murder someone, why would it be a random woman? Why wouldn't he just kill his wife, the woman he had so much turmoil with? Well, the thing is, when Jamie first called Jane about the murder, he answered that question himself. He didn't have the nerve to kill me, so he killed someone who resembled me. When I asked him in 2017 why he murdered Yvette Pena, this is how he tried to explain it. I killed her because it was, uh, how can I say it? Um, at that time, I wasn't living in a bad neighborhood. I was, I was living in Rosedale with my wife. I was taking medication, psych medication. I couldn't sleep, I was feeling, I was, I was feeling disconnected. I tried to live, uh, you know, a regular life, but, you know, just my whole character, my past and everything, it's just, it's just, I seen opportunity. I didn't know her. I didn't know her. I met her. I was introduced to her. I met her like one time, then I came back the next night, and I seen opportunity. No one's there. How much Jane had to do with Jamie's decision to kill Yvette Pena, we may never know. That's why he's such a mystery. If he just enjoyed killing, why didn't he just kill me? Jane says that question has haunted her. I should have really been dead instead of Yvette, and I had a lot of guilt. I had to do a lot of therapy that it was her, not me. And that's pretty twisted. And I used to ask Yvette for forgiveness in my prayers. We'll likely never know why Jamie spared the life of the mother of his child, but he didn't exactly leave her alone after he was arrested. My wife knows that a person like me, I could touch somebody even behind behind the, the walls of prison so that people could be touched no matter what. If by touching someone from behind bars meant messing with them, trying to ruin their life from a jail cell, police reports document plenty of that. For months, Jamie called Child Protective Services on Jane, multiple times a day, telling them outlandish stories to try to get her kids taken away. And of course, he continued to call Jane, threatening her, telling her he'd get his revenge. And when he would run out of phone time, he'd have other inmates call Jane on his behalf. One inmate finally told Jane that, quote, Osuna was stressing him out with his demands. How Jamie had any pull in jail, no one knows. I asked prosecutor Nick Lackey about this. Were you continuously thinking to yourself, how is he getting more and more and more tattoos while in jail? I figure they have ways. People get tattoos in jail. But he's on another level. I mean, I, of course, you know, I, I know people get tattoos in jail, but I mean, with him, it's literally, he went from having, I would say maybe like half of his face covered to, the full face. 
Well, why would he not? When you when you look at the guy and everything he's done and, and said, like, why would he? If tattoos are available to him, why would he not go all out and just make himself into this cartoon? He's he, he's a cartoon character. That's yeah. how he views himself and wants other people to view him. I really don't know how he was pulling it off, though, because it's my understanding when he was in Lairdo, he was um, single cell the whole time. It seems like he's very resourceful in the pursuit of getting what he wants. I mean, his wife says, said to me, how, how in the world was he able to mail me a dead rat? Which is a great question. I have no idea how he pulled that off. I wondered that, and a lot of other people wondered that at the time, too. It seems like that's something that Lerdo would catch, you would think. You would think, yeah. Bloody letters, like pentagrams, talking about my evil, diseased, dead mother. I'm a sister of the devil, the dirty devil, all devil, worshipping type. Horrible letters, he sent them in blood. Um, he sent me a dead, smashed rat. Tell me about that. A... Tell me about opening that letter. I thought it was one of those little rosaries they make and all kinds of stuff they make in jail. I opened it and the rat fell out. Police never explained. I said, how in the world did this get to me? Oh, we'll just collect the evidence. They you were upset. That... Well, I was highly upset. How are the police allowing this? I'll even tell you more how much the police... Are you going to... Are you going to sugarcoat... I'm going to be honest with you. Are you going to sugarcoat this about the police, about the sheriff's department? Because they did me really horrible with things. Osuna's bloody letters made it out of jail and into the hands of not just Jane. He also sent them to the district attorney. He was also caught trying to pass off a letter with Jane's address with instructions to kill her and set her house on fire. But then the worst happened. Child Protective Services showed up at Jane's door one day. But they weren't there because of Jamie. At least it didn't seem so. One of Jane's young children had told another adult that Jane had struck him. Police showed up and arrested Jane for misdemeanor cruelty to a child. For the first time in her life, Jane was on the other side of jail bars, inside a cell. Though she wasn't there long before she bailed out, she was transported from jail to family court to assess her child custody situation. That's when something downright chilling happened. The next bus trip that I took while I was in jail was to go to CPS court. It's in a van. And me and this other Hispanic girl get in last. The people in the cage is already in the cages. You can't really see through them. But I hear a laugh that just radiates up my spine. Jamie is one of the people in the back cages. And he tells the girl, he says, do it now and you'll get the drugs. She starts beating me in the back of my neck and I start yelling. The officers don't even pull over. Jamie's egging her on, screaming, yeah, do it, do it. I didn't hear any of that. And then when they finally pulled over, because I'm pitching, I'm screaming even louder than the whole van, then they finally say, well, just don't cry, suck it up, don't let him see you cry, just get back in. I'm like, no, my safety is at risk. I'm not getting back in there. You guys are pretending like it didn't happen. So I'm working in prison, I know what's going on. They didn't hear chains. They didn't hear me screaming. I know they did. There's no way to confirm this, especially because all family court records are sealed and Jamie was never criminally charged for anything relating to this specific incident. But within days after Jane's arrest, Jamie was caught with a note in his pocket, meant to pass off to another inmate. The handwritten note had Jane's actual jail cell number listed, and it said there's a price tag on her head. And later on, jail guards heard him say, quote, I should have got my wife that day in the van, according to police reports. The charges against Jane were eventually dropped, and Jane got her and Jamie's son back. But the father of her other minor child was awarded custody after her arrest. This is around the time she feels she had a nervous breakdown and needed to address everything that had happened since she met Jamie. 
She began going to a therapist and says she still regularly attends counseling. She says as soon as she faced her trauma, she was able to get her life back together, which is around the time Jamie began to slowly fade away. He'd always say, you're never going to win. And I used to tell him, no, you're never going to win. Because I did pick up my life afterwards. And I think that he realized towards the end of his calls that I was doing fine. Mentally, financially, I think he realized he, he didn't win. He lost. He's doing life without. Do you see what I'm saying? And I still had life. And I was enjoying it. Today, Jane does really seem to be in a good place. Jamie is part of her past, but she'll never stop fully wondering. Why add me in the mix? Why get married, have a child? Do you see what I'm saying? If killing someone is the ultimate, better than drugs, sex, anything, he's kind of contradicting himself because why try to live normal for whatever amount of time? Jane worries how she'll ever be able to explain that to the son she had with Jamie. But before he was arrested for murder, Jamie did write a message in his son's baby book. My colleague will read that. To my son, from your dad, Jamie. Well, son, I want you to know that I love you and I'm proud to be your father. You are my firstborn child and I love you to death. Me and your mom are going through rough times right now due to my mistakes and I'm sorry. I'm going to bounce back from my mistakes for you and your mom. Your mom is a strong person and she's hanging in there. We're trying our best. I hope to still be enough of a father when you're old and read this. Well, I wish you a positive, successful life and don't make the same mistakes I have in my life. And know mommy and daddy love you. In the brief time Jamie spent as an adult living outside of a jail cell, He wreaked havoc, violence, and terror on many. But what about before all that? I think as a kid who never had a chance. That's next time on The Man with a Thousand Faces. The Man with a Thousand Faces is written and reported by me, Olivia LaVoice. Maricel Maldonado is our editor and sound mixer. Patricia Rocha is our executive producer. Michael Trihe is our news director. For photos and bonus content, go to thousandfacespodcast.com. Copyright Next Star Media Group, Incorporated. If you like this story, please check out another project of ours, one we call Murdered and Forgotten. Our focus is identifying two Jane Doe's, both brutally murdered in 1980. We know who the killer is, but this story isn't over until we know who the victims are and can bring them home to their families. There are so many clues. Please go to murderedandforgotten.com.